Oh, it's been wonderful. I have no problems at all. It's been awful. It's been absolutely awful. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I came into this line of work completely naive about what would happen. I would like the people who are listening to this to really understand that we're no longer at a point where it's a luxury to have a much deeper level of consciousness about what it is that we are doing and why and the implications. Mm -hmm. I don't think it takes a genius or a particularly spiritual person to see that. So, you know, it's interesting me as a spiritual teacher, you know, like asking me what I would say. And I, you know, I would say, I, I don't even really care right at this moment, whether people consider themselves spiritual or go down the path of spirituality. You don't even need to call it that. We need to go down the path of awareness, no yeah. matter what field we're in. Welcome to the Global Affair Podcast, brought to you by Love Out Loud, the world's largest love-based movement, actualizing a civilization of love by 2030. My name's Nicole Gibson, and join me and some of the world's brightest minds as we bring some of the most important and controversial conversations of our time into a space of unity. It's important to know that as your host, this isn't about my personal opinion or bias, but rather an opportunity to listen with love, honesty, curiosity, and reveal the true universal experience us humans have amongst the differences. So if you love the show, please let us know by giving us a rating and tell us how to make this conversation easier for other people to jump into as well. And with that, let's get it. Till Swan, welcome to The Global Affair. I've personally been really looking forward to this episode because I believe that trauma in the global leadership landscape is something that um, many people want to talk about, maybe you're aware that it's something that needs to be talked about, but perhaps don't necessarily know how to articulate some of the things that they, that they, that they witness, they observe. Um, and as I know you know, and many of our listeners know, we're on the precipice of, of a renaissance in many ways. We're going through a massive transition globally. Uh, and the more that we can have these conversations, uh, the better. And your perspective is is so unique. So I'm very much looking forward to, yeah, to, to diving in. But I'd love uh, for anyone that that isn't as familiar with your work, if you could just summarize your your mission um, in your work on the planet and the legacy that you're you're driving through your work. In a lot of ways, I feel like I have the same goal that so many spiritual leaders have had across history, which is to alleviate suffering. I want to figure out the answer to suffering, human suffering, and solve it. Um, Big mission. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. <laughs> yeah. And um, I feel like in your, in your mind there, just, just so that we can sort of get the, the context of, of this, um, yeah. how do you differentiate, say, pain from suffering? I see pain as something which is informative. It's like when you when you experience the unwanted, which is really the basis of pain, that gives you a lot of insight into what it is that you're wanting, what it is you need to put your energy into. So there's almost like a directive force to that. There's a direction to go with pain. When it comes to suffering, it's not that way. It's like there's definitely a powerlessness that comes with it. There's a, a sense of not having a direction to go and you're stuck in an unwanted situation. So yeah. <clears throat> pain is something which I would not necessarily say is, is avoidable in this life, but suffering absolutely is. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And um, unresolved suffering, you know, on an individual level, the way that that um, begins to manifest through, <laughs> um, <laughs> through individuals specifically as they rise to power, right? And um, yeah. I'm curious to, to just hear some of your observations, maybe um, on the global affairs that we're seeing at large and, and how this could be playing out. Well, I mean, psychologists would be having a heyday right now because we've got <laughs> an entire collection of people who fall into the sociopathic narcissistic spectrum, you know? <laughs> and I mean, let's just take one person. I, I kind of want to break this down because so many of the people who are in these leadership positions today, they have this deep seated self concept of inadequacy. And what they're doing is trying to move away from their inadequacy through gaining as much power and control as they possibly can. So what you see in the world today is like so many individuals who are just plowing forward for a sake of personal self-esteem, unwilling to self-reflect because they're you know compensating for a, a poor self-image with this. It's actually a false inflated sense of um, personal esteem, which is covering over that, that pathology. And they're willing to 
cause any amount of collateral damage to establish that that sort of sense of self which they've been going for since their childhood so these unresolved traumas that happen honestly in childhood <laughs> they're now being played out on the world stage i mean what happens when we've got somebody who's stuck in almost their toddler years in terms of a, a sense of self the development of a sense of self and they've got their finger on a nuclear weapon do you think that they really care about the collateral damage with the people that are going to be caught in the crossfires hell no they don't have the capacity to think about others why because they've never been taught what it is to truly experience trust mm. so you know it's, it's a little you know for my it's hard to watch if i'm going to be completely honest with you Especially sure. when you understand what it takes to go th go through these patterns, it's difficult to watch this playing out on such an extreme level in a global way and feel like, oh God, you know, <laughs> it's avoidable is the sad part. It's avoidable mm -hmm. in terms of the way that we're raising our children, most especially. Yeah, I really I couldn't agree more with that. I, I, one of the um, the cornerstones of, of my 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 work historically has been helping people really understand um, the importance of rites of passage and the process of initiation from one one period of life to the next period of life, and the fact that that um, really requires you know a, a tenderness in how it's facilitated, you know, a care in how it's facilitated. Even if that means going and hunting the tiger and facing off with your own morality, there's got to be an intentionality. And when that's not there, um, we see basically like peers initiating peers, children initiating children, and really, you know, men who are still boys and women who are still girls. Uh, how many of the world's problems could be saved uh, or spared, I should say, by by that initiation happening in a in a more tribalistic way um, mm -hmm. as as it once was. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, please, share. <laughs> oh, I just, you've met somebody who's more passionate about the move back towards a tribal society than pretty much anybody I've ever talked to. So it's like you use that word and all of a sudden, like all of me, it just lights up because that's, that's exactly where humanity's headed. Yeah, right. And, and this was my observation um, also in global leadership around some of these uh, things that you're pointing to is as a you know, a tribal being as an animal, we really only have the capacity to empathize with about what 120 people at best, um, to have true empathy for a small group of people that would have been our immediate tribe. And now we have people that, you know, a single decision can impact, you know, eight, nine billion people, um, which is so radically removed, arguably from what is uh, innate about us as an animal. And yet, as a human being, we have this uh, profound potential. We have this ability to evolve to a place where we have influence and, and power over millions and billions of people and, and, and what to do with that, you know, how, how to allow human beings to harness this great infinite imagination and this great infinite potential without removing them from what is kind of fundamentally most natural. You want me to comment on that one? Of course. Yeah. I don't think it's an option anymore for people who are in leadership positions to not commit to a genuine path of awakening. I think we're at this place where what would be traditionally regarded as a spiritual practice must be taken on by people who are in these positions because we are limited to, like you mentioned, empathy for a certain amount of people to the degree where our consciousness has or has not expanded that actually changes that threshold changes what we notice when people are you know on this path of awakening and they're expanding and expanding and expanding their consciousness is that you develop the capacity to take all things as a part of yourself the absolute ultimate manifestation of this being what people are, are um, usually calling enlightenment mm -hmm. so when we have got individuals who are at the point where they're influencing that many people they need to be at the place where they are capable of taking that many people into account and to do that you have to transcend your own biology mm, yes and then on the other side of that we've got a population right that are also asleep and consuming um whether it's the media or the decisions in a in a relatively passive way and it's also majority in numbers right you've got a few leaders and then uh, a population of people that are in one way or another, really kind of prescribing power to those leaders, um, you know, what to do around uh, on, on that side of the spectrum 
how much of a responsibility is it for each person, including, um, you know, Sarah, who's living somewhere in the the Midwest, who who might not even be able to name some some global leaders in different countries. How much is it her responsibility to um, to find that sense of personal sovereignty and power? I think it's both. I think that leaders have a lot of that responsibility, and individuals have likewise responsibility. There's nobody that is exempt from free will and the impact of cause and effect. And everybody has a part to play in the picture of cause and effect. My issue is that if we're going to, you know, really hold people accountable to this, we need to also increase our level of exposure of these types of things. You know, um, not many, I mean, it's ironic because I think it was Osho that used to talk a lot about the fact that awakening is like luxury. You know, <laughs> When you're just struggling to feed your family, it's not something you have time to sit there and do. So it's like, as a society, we need to make these things possible to do that, that, you know, introducing things like meditation into very early education systems, things like, you know, constructive debate in elementary, starting in elementary school, these types of things steps an individual into the position where they or even thinking on the level of, wait a minute, maybe I have an impact, or thinking on the level of, wait, maybe I should self-reflect, you know? <laughs> I mean, right now, the way that we've got it, it's not, it's not like most people get to that in a positive way, by being kind of led there uh, by people who are teaching them to practice in this way. We're finding our way to this by suffering. Most people, you know, they're like, what is going on here? And then they're suffering their ass off, honestly, in the society, and then they hit this point where they're like, I can't do it anymore. And that's the point at which they, they find all of these, you know, very powerful ways of being and ways of thinking. And they start to approach things in alternative ways. And I, I actually don't think it's necessary to hit that tree at 90 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yet, go back you know, to, it's so interesting. This conversation just like keeps leading me back to children. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't oh, talk yeah. a lot about that actually. And with a lot of people, because a lot of people, when they're interviewing me, they want to know about patterns in adulthood and how to change them. But it's like, when we're going to here to talk about change on the planet, then you're squarely focusing your laser and sights on children is what you're doing. Yeah. hundred percent. The, the child in the adults that are running our world and, and the future generations. Um, Good luck accessing those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's why we've got people like you, Till, right? Um, <laughs> people that can see through. And actually, that there's an observation that um, in my own leadership journey, I've I've come to around how how quick people are to take um, someone on face value. You know, one one dimensional vision of if someone's defensive or angry, they they think that they're a defensive or angry person. If someone's strong, they believe that they're a strong person without asking the question, well, why did that person have to become strong? What, what was it about their life circumstance that led them to become that? It's just not a level of kind of insight that um, I notice, especially in leaders. I totally agree. Yep. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, I, I do believe that that's a big part of the change. Um, love, love thy neighbor, you know, learn, learn to look a little bit deeper and, and have that, that inquiry and that curiosity around each other so that we have fucking space to breathe, actually. <laughs> um, so that we can actually, like, go there and feel safe enough to, to reflect on ourselves, whereas a lot of people, they don't have access to um, a certain degree of self-love or self-acceptance. Self-reflection feels intolerable. Yes. Right? So. Uh, Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm curious to hear kind of your thoughts on that and maybe some beginning solutions of how we can break down some of those, some of those walls in how we interact, especially as leaders. We got to start making vulnerability okay and not something that we exploit. I feel like this whole process begins with us making each other safe. But in order to make each other safe, we have to make ourselves safe. So it kind of starts with us looking at ourselves and understanding that when we have power in any way, we have the capacity to damage people or benefit people with that power. Mm. I don't feel like people in power um, put enough energy into figuring out just how much power they have. I mean, if I'm being honest, it's like when you're in a position of leadership of any kind or power of any kind, you have to understand the amount of damage you can do. And you have to understand it very deeply. You have to almost like see the shadow potentials of whatever your aptitudes are, because that's a, an item of power. And then it's like you're in this active dance of, of working with fire. I mean, we're pl- all of us are playing with fire in a way with whatever we hold power in. And every single 
being on this earth, be it a leader or not, every single person on this earth has serious aptitudes and therefore serious points of power. And it's, it's, I mean, that is really the open door for us to cause pain for other people. So, mm-hmm. you know, you were asking me about how to, how to make it so that we can open up these doors for each other within society more. It's about making sure that we ourselves are safe. Mm. This is a really powerful statement. Um, you know, the, the, the power we hold over people unconsciously in particular is is really the um at the core of the the pain um that that we will most likely create for others and and in the world and really to ourselves as well right because what we're doing to someone else is is ultimately um something that we're doing to ourselves and i know that even personally you know to share from my own vulnerability rising to success very young and very quickly i had no idea the power that i held i knew that um, I was succeeding. I knew that I was, um, you know, that, 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 that the things that I would dreamt of were happening. But when it came to the way that I was relating to those in my life and, and how I was seen um, and the impact of my words, you know, some, sometimes even words that just I, it was a throwaway comment because I wasn't practicing the level of intentionality and, and consciousness that I now aspire to was a very, very difficult thing for me to wake up to. And it did take suffering. Actually, it took turns of events where my power was was challenged ultimately in in order to really start to see that um and you know the the series of ego deaths that then go go (laughs) after go after that right which which i'm actually extremely grateful for because i'm a better person and a better leader for that um but the the pain of actually being able to face the realities of power dynamics in our world and the power dynamics that exist in our life it was confronting just how difficult that was to look at. And it's something that I still, you know, think about a lot. It's what I wrote my last book about. Um, and I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on this. Like, why is it so hard for us to face the reality and the magnitude in which we might have power over someone or the magnitude in which someone might have power over us? Because humans have a very dichotomous relationship with power. We have this negative relationship with it and we love to talk about how horrible power is at the same time there's not a single human being not a single human being on earth that doesn't want it (laughs) so it's like now we've got this everybody's just engaged in a shadow game of trying to go for power in whatever way is possible and that's when power becomes a shadow game meaning it's operating underneath our conscious awareness that's when stuff gets real dangerous Mm. yeah I just uh, finished reading the 48 Laws of Power, and by the end, I was the you know the ultimate fan of this book. But I've got to say, for the first like few chapters, I was like, "This is so um, much to to actually receive and read because it's so true." You know, it's basically the premise of the book is we're all seeking power all the time. Those Everyone. that those that believe that they're not seeking power are the worst of them all. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and basically these are the rules you know that that um as to how that plays out in our world and it was it was confrontingly true um oh, yeah. and it also I, I i finished that book really feeling like wow part of the challenge here is the ideas of power and love have been so separate for so long yeah. you know that that we're either pursuing power or we have people that are also pursuing power but doing it under the guise of love you know, and and that these um, or those that really do love, you know, unconditionally, but aren't empowered in themselves. And my conclusion is, you know, power is this animal self. Going back to tribalism, it's the body. It's what the body wants to express. It's the power that you know is our our needs and our life force and our will. And then love, which is our wisdom, our higher consciousness. And we've got to find a way to to bring these together in in harmony. You want me to just comment on that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I can ask specific questions, but I feel uh, just, I just, just I, bouncing I love talking power. Yeah. Power is one of my favorite topics. Great. Power goes far beyond the body. Um, okay, so let's we got to define power for people. Mm-hmm. Power is really the capacity to bring about what you want. That's it. It's you can simplify it just like that. Yeah. Because if if we were to sit here and name any type of power, I mean anything under the sun. Yeah. 
the reason why somebody would want that is because they believe that having that, whatever it is, whether it's money or whether it's beauty or whether it's what other forms of power are there? Influence. Status. Um, yeah. All it does for somebody is make it so that they can feel like they can bring about what it is that they want. Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting because there's not a single being on the, on the planet. It doesn't matter whether it's human or not. That doesn't, I should say the picture of their life isn't about some kind of progress in the direction of what it is that they desire. So the picture of personal expansion is integrally linked with power. Now, the process of expansion goes far beyond the physical. That's something that is in play with the non-physical self, even in the decision to come into this specific time-space reality. So you see even power dynamics at play with why a, a, you know, let's say a stream of consciousness, what most people call the soul, would even choose a specific incarnation is -hmm. because of points of power. I see this a lot when I'm working with people with um, generational traumas and generational aptitudes. You've got, let's call it a soul, because people really relate to this, even though most people think of it like a clump of energy. Um, You've got like a stream of consciousness who's essentially surveying an entire family line for what positive patterns weave through that family line so as to give that entity the best chance at the actualization of whatever it is that they have intended. So let's say that you've got somebody who's like, you know, I really would like to come into this life experience. And in order to do that, I need to have X, Y, and Z aptitudes. Okay, well, I'm going to opt into a family line with that particular aptitude, because that is a point of power for me. So we've got power dynamics even playing into things pre-birth, right? (laughs) And then as we're progressing through our life, it's like the picture of our personal expansion is, I experience this unwanted thing, which is a big part of coming down into this time-space reality is this contrast, which we all experience being a fundamental element of life on Earth. So we experience this unwanted. That gives rise to a very deep understanding of what is wanted. And then we've got to find strategies to go in the direction of what is wanted so that we can then manifest that or live that out. Mm. So when people start to go into resistance about power, it's like very important for them to understand that power is literally nothing more than the the ability to bring about what is wanted. And that takes the heat out of it. It's just right now, as people, we are completely convinced that others are against our own process of that, which is why so much of the focus around power is not about bringing about what one wants, but rather power over others. But a person only gets there because they're convinced that other people are an adversarial force to what one wants to bring about. And this mm-hmm. is where we're going to change stuff because you know, what you were mentioning before is there's, there's this perceived uh, clash between the concept of power and gaining power and love. And there does not have to be. Mm-hmm. And there is, I see there as being actually no problem between these two. They should go perfectly and can go perfectly hand in hand. You know, if you're rising into power at the same time able to take others as a part of the self, which is really the most basic definition of love, then you can, this gives you the capacity to bring about what is wanted, not only for yourself, but other people. So other people are included in the picture of each other's desires. And it becomes this very beautiful thing. So I'm very excited about people claiming their own personal power in conjunction with very proudly practicing what it is to love and understanding that they don't need to be in opposition to power in general, afraid of power, especially afraid of their own power. It has nothing Mm. to do with the practice of consideration of others or finding win-win scenarios. Mm. Amen to that. So this really simple definition of power, I think is useful for our listeners. The, the, your, basically the, the strength of your will, the ability to bring about what it is you're, you're wanting to create in life. Do you have a, a version of that for love? Yeah. So the most simple definition of love is to take something as a part of the self. Um, When you take something as a part of the self, a very powerful thing happens where you're in such a deep connection to that thing that no harm can come to that thing without it also impacting the self. Now, this is Mm. what creates this motivation to meet specific needs in the other or to, you know, caretake the other in some way. And there's no way for you to play a zero sum game then. Because if you play a zero sum game, there is a there's a negative impact to self. So it's this very interesting thing, because a lot of people, when they really comprehend what love genuinely is, it's 
it's moving you more towards a state of inclusion of everything in the picture of I. And that's very different to the state of narcissism where there is no other. There's just a projection of self and self on the other, right? So mm. you see like very deep um, patterns of positive ownership of things in a state of genuine love. But mm. we are usually, when we're thinking about love, we're actually thinking of, you know, a lot of the byproducts we want to have come from love. So when somebody takes us as a part of them, we're thinking, oh, I'm going to be valued then. I'm going to be understood then. So we're almost, we're looking to the byproducts and calling that love, right? Mm -hmm. Also, I do want to mention that when most people talk about love, they're not actually talking about love. They're talking about like wanting to be valued. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is at the most basic definition, it is to take something as a part of the self. Self-love, you can't really comprehend and understand without understanding the idea that consciousness itself fragments. So you may be talking to an individual person that by one name, that's the way we walk around the world, right? We don't like introduce ourselves one minute as Rebecca and then the next minute is like Emily. So, um, so <laughs> we get lost in this mentality that, that there's this sort of singular being in front of us, but that's not the truth. Self-love is really, really easy to understand when you can comprehend the fact that you've got this internal relationship between aspects of the self and that can either be an adversarial relationship or one of those positive ownership relationships. Hmm. So the practice of self-love is really instead of rejecting and denying and disowning and pushing away and shaming certain aspects of myself, I'm taking positive ownership of certain aspects of myself. So I'm acting in their best interests. I'm deeply understanding them. I'm integrating them into the picture of the whole. <sighs> I hope hmm. this makes more sense. A hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. You know, I I really agree that the, the process of love is the integration of, of all things, essentially. And yeah. I think that that's so in opposition, right, of what we've been what we've been taught, the idea that Hollywood's kind of sold us. Um oh. and it <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's another podcast. We don't have to go into <laughs> into Disney and, and Hollywood and the way that we've programmed Attention, our society. Wow. <laughs> I mean, wow. That's like, it's like the matrix, just like. That's some shame. That is a vacuum. Vacuum. Don't, don't talk about the truth of love. A few moments later. So to backtrack. <laughs> where, where were we? Um, oh, the integration. Yeah. So when I really started to, to understand that love is the integration of all things and not just the, um, you know, the picking and choosing of, of what makes us feel good or feel valued. Um, you know, not only was that extremely paradigm shifting, but you also start to wake up to this, um, this very thing that you're talking about that within love is actually the ultimate power to not yeah. be in opposition, you know, with, yeah. with what is around you and to have reality you know, bend to your will to, to manifest and actualize the way that you really um, desire it to, how much easier that becomes when you're not using your energy opposing um, others or things around you. Um, and I'm curious, you know, what, what's been your journey through the, the, the claiming of your power and being able to love um, through all that you've journeyed um, through your rise? And I, I, I you know, to, to in my own way, I understand what that what that's like. It's not for the faint-hearted. There there are times where you have to make many difficult decisions, and you have to be so okay not being understood. Um, and it it can bring up parts of us that are maybe not yet enlightened. Um, how's that journey been been for you, Till? Oh, it's been wonderful. I have no problems at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's been it's been terrible. Uh, <laughs> It's been awful. It's been absolutely awful. Yeah. Um, mm. I came into this line of work completely naive about what would happen. Right. I, but I, the, the thing is, is that I had, I mean, it's ironic to say for somebody who had a childhood of such extreme levels of abuse, but I've always had a very unnatural level of personal power. Unnatural being, I, I want to say it's almost more yeah, natural it's, for it's beings, but un, yeah. <laughs> unnatural for what a normal child has, you know? I've always had a, a very good connection to my free will. And I'm sure if my mother was on this podcast with you right now, she'd be like, uh, yeah, um, this child was impossible for me. <laughs> so I didn't really understand consciously what big of a problem people would have with other people's power. 
mm-hmm. you know? And I, I was very much not really understanding that we can have a sense of what our own motives are, but that doesn't mean everybody else gets a sense of that same motive. And I didn't have a proper understanding of people's horrific relationship with authority and how all of that would be projected. I mean, it's like anything. You walk into any line of work, I feel like, and you're just, oh, crap, this is going to be just like a never-ending um, roller coaster of lessons. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, it was, it's been really rough to step into this and have people have a very, very, very big problem with power and my power specifically. And how so much of that has turned into a war, not even against what I'm talking about, because I came into this prepared to have conversations about the content itself, conversations about the definition of love, for example, conversations about things like you know justice reform and where that has to go, because I knew there'd be tons of resistance there. What I was not prepared for was a complete character assassination, which is exactly where people go when they're terrified of the source of information. So it's been very rough to navigate the, I would say the land of this almost like needing to answer to some of these immense zero sum games, which I've been put in at the same time as not go into a state of complete resistance to others. Cause it's real tempting, especially when you've got your protector parts activated, you know, <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, if you had more specific questions about certain things, I could definitely tell you what they've been like. It's just been this overall terrible experience. I have to say. <laughs> I, I empathize with that, extend my own, you know, lo- love to, to your journey in that. Um, yeah, there's there's definitely more questions there, I think, in, in terms of how those listening to this conversation who who aren't even necessarily on a path yet to awakening their consciousness, uh, they don't have anywhere near the, the amount of tools that you do. You know, this this very experience is a thing that, that, that renders them completely afraid of vulnerability, makes uh-huh. them feel entirely unsafe. and adopt an attitude where I'm just going to have those who are closest to me that are going to be the only ones that I truly, you know, love and care about because that's, that's actually the thing that common sense would do, you know, and then someone like yourself, and it's still been a painful journey with, with all the tools. Um, yeah, I mean, we can get to maybe what someone at the start of their journey could do to, to start to it's kind of in, in, embrace how, how challenging and difficult it is. Maybe we can talk about the perks and the, the light okay. that's waiting on the other side. But just to reflect on your own journey, what were some, what were some of the, the reframes and the tools that allowed you through those experiences to stay focused on what really matters and what your mission was? It's going to sound funny, but I, I decided to let them break me. And on the outside, hmm. it's going to look like exactly the opposite. On the outside, I look like a seriously tenacious creature who, despite opposition, is just like, screw you guys, kill me first. You know what I mean? And like, I will definitely, you'll hear me sometimes have conversations like that where I'm like, well, go ahead. It's basically this or death. So kill me then. But um, what it is, is that when, when I have been so deeply destroyed on a level of identity, I have had the commitment to letting my identity die. Mm. So it's almost like approaching all of the opposition that you get as almost like it's a fire that's going to burn away everything that is not truly meaningful. Mm -hmm. And in a way it's definitely done that it's burned away a lot of these layers so that what's left is what I genuinely value. Mm. I'm talking the things where it's like this stuff matters 10 times more than what happens to me in my individual life, because remaining committed to that is the most in alignment feeling you can possibly experience. Mm. And I, one of the things, so you're saying, let's go to the perks, right? There is a serious perk to being in that level of integrity with yourself. Most of us live in this state of constant internal turmoil where we're kind of being drug in two different directions and we're like lost in this game of strategy and what true self-reflection and stripping these layers of self, you know, off so that you can actually get to the true essence of things. What it does is it gives you a North star that is so profoundly pulling that there's no more sense of lostness. And it's like you, you almost become very unshakable. It's a little bit like being a lighthouse where you get these waves that are kind of crashing against you. And it's not even like you really intended to develop this. It's just like all of a sudden you're hit by something and you're like, wait, that time it didn't cause me to go into doubt. 
Mm. I'm still able to question myself, but it's like there's no shakiness in my being. Mm. And it just kind of happens in you, you know? That's mm. been a really beautiful thing to experience that on the other side of this, for sure. Mm. Yeah. A nervous system that can be regulated regardless of what's of what's happening um, is a powerful person, you know, <laughs> and what, what you're, what you're speaking to, I think, um, really is, is anchored in a state of inner peace, right? When you know your intention and your integrity with, and you're in integrity with yourself and you're coming from a place of, of truth, whatever is coming up against you can't have equal power, you know, if, if it doesn't have a similar intention. And I know on my own journey, that's been a massively comforting, you know, knowing, although it's been very hard to hold um, at times, it's, it's been a, a really comforting knowing. And I'd like to talk about integrity because this is another topic that I think a lot of people don't necessarily really understand. Like what is integrity? And another specific question I have for you in your own thinking, do you differentiate, but do you have a differentiation between moral good and integrity? Or do you see these things as uh, mutually exclusive? I mean, I'm obviously a philosopher when it comes to subjects like this. I mean, the concept of moral good is something that needs to be turned over with as much intensity (laughs) as we tumble stones. Let's go. Let's go. I, I, Maybe let's, let's define integrity first and then we can break down and I might just add a context around why why I'm curious about this question, which can guide the conversation. Okay, I, I very much define integrity as a state of alignment between aspects of self. Mm. So in a state of integrity, there is no contradiction in the internal patterns within a person, especially around values. So let's say that to be out of integrity with yourself, is to, let's say I'm walking around the world and I'm saying things like, you know, it's very important to make sure that all sexual interaction between people is consensual. And then in my nightlife, I'm like raping people. That is out of integrity because in this moment, I'm not in a state of alignment. Mm -hmm. So it's when your thoughts, your words, and your actions are in alignment with whatever you have essentially chosen or decided upon or whatever you hold to be valuable and most important. Hmm. What about a time where maybe someone does have contradiction? You know, and and the 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 truth is, okay, there are parts of me that are, con- that are in conflict right now. There's there's this innate kind of contradiction around the things that I think and feel. Um, what would integrity in those moments do? How would it think? How would it move? You you can't have integrity in that moment. You have to establish it, and the way you establish it is by actually forming a positive and working relationship between those two aspects. Mm-hmm. This is why so one really, of the things that I'm teaching people most right now is is how to work with parts or aspects of their consciousness, because that is a way that you can take aspects that may be at odds internally and get them to understand each other enough to find a win-win or a way of working together. Hmm. And in doing yeah. so, you get, I mean, what's revealed is more personal truth, much deeper levels of personal truth. Hmm. Yeah. Antagonizing these things. You know, the, the Greeks used to say, um, speaking of philosophers, that the the truth is is ultimately the only defensible thing. So the the reason there was such an appetite for debate is because there was a fundamental understanding that to antagonize ideas again and again and again, only the truthful ideas are going to be the ones that that remain. And I love that. And I think we're missing <laughs> that so much, right? From from our world. And that actually is the context of of this differentiation between moral good, which I think has really been weaponized in our world. You know, we're wearing this like idea of morality as a badge and people believe that it's integrity. And, and I see these two things as, as very different. Um, and I think we need to be able to, <laughs> yeah, break this down. So I'll just kind of let you speak to that and then we can see where it goes. Morality is a judgment about what's good and bad and right and wrong. Mm-hmm. And most of the time we're completely wrong about it. So it's like that the word morality has got like a trigger word for me, you know, mm-hmm. because of this, because I see it as being something which is so incredibly divorced from the overall picture of truth and divorced mm-hmm. from definitely the willingness to understand opposing perspectives. 
Mm. It takes us as far away from that as we possibly can get, you know, and you see this playing out across the political world in such an extreme way, you know, mm -hmm. especially on election years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And when you've got, you know, the, the WF, WEF, um, just after, uh, after Davos this year, the third greatest existential threat listed was a polarized society. I mean, let's just skip past the irony of that um, coming from the WEF and, and move into, uh, you know, what that's, that's really pointing to is that, and I actually, I agree that the fact that we're now living in these silos where the only way for me to feel safe and validated and affirmed is for you to agree with everything that I say and everything that I am. Um, and if that doesn't exist, rather than trying to expand myself, get uncomfortable emotionally, you know, uh, look beyond my own perspective of life and, and try to see life through your eyes a little bit where we're cutting and we're canceling. Yep. Um, I mean, that to me is, is, has got to be one of the fastest roads to hell and, and, a, oh, yeah. and a path that we're, you know, willingly paving. Um, why have we gotten here from your perspective? And, and why, think... is, why are so many people blind to that? You know, believing it's that it's 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 unity to all think the same thing, and you know, I don't think most people are looking for unity right now. I think that more and more people are actually looking for individuation. Hmm. I think it's a whole host. It's like a recipe. You know, when you've got a recipe, you've got a whole host of different ingredients. And when I look at the picture of what we're talking about right now, I definitely see these these different ingredients. So I can name a few of them. Um, one of them is that you've got, you know, algorithms for social media and for technology. And these algorithms are essentially closing us off to the point where all we interact with now is what confirms our own biases. <laughs> you know, and it's, I mean, sometimes it scares me, honestly, but it's like when I have to, I have to look at myself sometimes, you know, mm. what, am I really following channels on my social media accounts when I'm on them? of people who contradict my opinion. No, that's the truth. I'm not. <laughs> what happens is I look at my Facebook account. I watch people who are like, oh, I love that idea. And then I follow them. So now all of a sudden I'm closed off in this bubble, right? So you'll see me kind of walking around the house a lot thinking about this thing where I'm like, oh my God, like here I am part of the issue. Like I've got all my entire like algorithm on Instagram set to just sort of like make me feel awesome about my own ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I think, I think some of that is quite innocent, right? It's that we push the like button on something that we like. And when something triggers us, we're like in this, you know, in the comment section being like, no, get it away from me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's one element. Another element is that we've got an interesting thing happening with the generations here, because if you look back in history, We've never had a time like this where the expansion is so rapid since the invention of the internet that information has made it so that life for one generation is so dramatically different than it was for the previous generation that there's, there's almost a transfer. So with the millennials, you really saw them coming into a world where the formula that was given to them by the, by the boomer generation didn't work. Hmm. So you've got a, a generation that feels very damaged, superbly damaged by authority figures. And they're, they're looking to set themselves apart. They're being in a, they've been put in a position where it's like, everybody misleads me. And so it's like, I, I want to do what's right for me and I need to break the mold. And it's, a, it's like, there's almost a very destructive, angry pattern that's going on there. And then you've got the disillusionment of the Gen Z population, right? And the Gen Z population more than any other generation has not owned anybody else. This is a generation that's like looking at everybody else's dysfunction is like, all right, I'm just going to do me then. Yeah. You know? To the extreme. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to the extreme. So you've got like those, those generational factors that are coming into this also. And so it's like, it's a lot about, you know, our nature. It's a lot about what we like psychologically. It's a lot about almost the endorphin release in our own brain when we see things that confirm what it is that we already think that feels good we can't deny that right and a lot of it is also down to the fact that when we are when we're children we are not taught this anymore now i haven't i haven't yet gone back in time to figure out where that breakdown was but it, there was definitely much more of an openness to discussions around contradictory opinions than there is now 
now yeah. it's like a full-on shutdown and i'm watching this is why i mentioned it in the beginning i'm watching this thing where like you know children are not being taught how to have these constructive conversations there's this collective it's like a scary level of idiocy that it is possible to form these camps in opposition without there being massive consequences mm -hmm. and i i feel like one of the things that technology has done is it's given us a false sense of connectivity where we didn't used to be able to get that in the same way. And so we were much more dependent on our immediate physical communities. And when you're in a, like a tight knit community or a tribe, you really must find a way to make it work with these people or else you're going to be hurting and everyone's going to be hurting. Now it's like, I'm, you know, I'm, people don't have that same sense. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's almost like we've lost the, we've lost the knowledge that it's not an option for us, especially not when we've got weapons like we've got, you know, if we're going to blow yeah. this up past the individual level on the global scale, like this is, you guys, this is not an option that we have to not be able to have constructive conversations and to not find win-wins is not an option for us. We're playing right now with technology and weaponry, which is so far beyond even our control. We play that game at that level. Everyone's going to die. That's what will happen. And I know that that frustrates people when I say that because they're like, God, you're so doomsday till, you know? <laughs> I'm like, if you understood so gonna... as a human, <laughs> if people understood how close they are at all moments to the brink of so many different factors taking them out, whether it's a single celled organism or a weapon that's been invented <laughs> or, you know, a piece of technology that's gained more awareness than a human being. It's just like, you guys, I mean, you're, this is crazy. We are like spinning on a ball at thousands of miles an hour through space with these levels of threat that are just like, you know, if the Yellowstone geyser goes, we're fucking done. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm kind of like wanting people to wake up to the fact that the leeway that they think that they have, they don't have. Mm -hmm. This includes our relationship, not just with other people, but with other elements of our environment. Mm -hmm. you know, the complacency. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, the, um, the, the, the constant willingness to, to, to believe that it's t tomorrow's problem. Uh, I've, I've also analyzed kind of this syndrome. And I think a, another thing to add to the list is that the cost of convenience, you know, we've become so placated that everything is on demand all the time, that there is no like real need in our day-to-day -day situation to, um, you know, when, when you're contemplating these kinds of things, especially existential threats, right, it takes energy, it takes effort to sit and contemplate. Like the, the Greeks used to sit and contemplate a single thought for decades. Now we're lucky <laughs> if we can get someone's attention for like five seconds on a TikTok video, like the yep. disparity is out of control. So when you're asking people, which I also do through my work to say, hey, let's let's talk about the existential threat that is AI and how is it going to get coded and what is the evolutionary kind of uh, requirement within within this conversation, things like war and what we're on the precipice of at the moment. It takes so much effort to sit and actually regulate and try to examine things from different perspectives, effort that I don't believe people have been um, trained. You know, they're not necessarily fit enough to be able to entertain that. Um, just like you can't expect to run a marathon overnight. You know, so these, these stages of kind of evolving one system, mind, heart, emotional body, consciousness, spirit, to, to be able to even go there, I think is, is a problem. When we have the, the echo chamber of what our day-to-day -day is, is looking like at the moment, we have food on demand, sex on demand. You know, I, even for me as a millennial, I had to like wait a week to watch the next Simpsons episode. You know, now we can just binge watch. You know, it, we don't even have to go to the TV to, to say next on Netflix. It's just like a countdown of five seconds. You know, yeah. like this is, this is the world that we're living in. We don't have to wait for anything that brings us um, fulfillment or kind of that, that, that dopamine. I think that that's the most problematic thing. We shouldn't be aiming for convenience. Yeah, I've toyed with this idea and I feel like we need to take a, a two-part approach. Um, training people to put more effort in consciously is something, including this includes attention span is something I feel like we need to do at the same time. I really yep. feel like the people that are going to be the most successful with bringing about real positive change are the people who make it easy for people to do so, you know? Mm. I think about this a lot when I think about, you know, the, the new inventions which need to be made in order to, say, make this a world where it's easier to 
live your day-to-day life without causing suffering to someone or something. I'm like, really the entrepreneurs of the future need to make this something which people don't have to think a lot about. Otherwise this isn't going to work. <laughs> you know. That's really, really interesting. I'd love if, if this is something that you've thought kind of extensively about, I'd love you to, to just take us into some of those thoughts, especially because it's so relevant to our audience. Some of the, the key questions that you believe current technologists, innovators, entrepreneurs, um, need to be asking when they think about the design of their products, services, and, and solutions? Well, obviously anybody who's creating the new anything has to be hyper attuned to needs. And right now those needs are not just about personal gratification. They're about the overall picture of the best interest of humanity and the web that humanity is a part of, right? <laughs> So when you're thinking about that overall best interest, it's like, how do we make that appealing to the average person? That's first, right? Second is, you know, if we can make this appealing, how do we make it something which is, does not actually require a whole crap ton of effort? Because that's going to limit the field. I mean, we, we, we almost need to have two different conversations because I'm going to be over here trying to teach people things like it's worth the effort, guys, and you really need to put it in. But like, if I'm an entrepreneur, I'm going to throw that concept away. Just throw it out the water. <laughs> make and it be easy. like. Yeah, I, my whole thing has got to be, I have to make it so that the, a person doesn't have to be thinking about this because it's going to limit the field to only the people who care the most, you know? I think about this a lot when I'm on, I'm subscribed to sites, of course, typical teal. I'm subscribed to sites where it's like I'm signing petitions, you know, environmental <laughs> petitions. And I'm like, they have made this so difficult that they're selecting <laughs> only for people like me. Like, that's not a good, yeah. that's not a the great business plan. To do, to do the paperwork. Yeah. And I hate, I hate it, you know, because yeah. it's like every time I open those emails, it's like, look at this awful thing that happened to you. You're going to be up at 3 a.m. thinking about this awful thing to you, you know, and I'm and then like click this 800 800th button. And I'm like, oh, I, I feel like crap after 15 minutes, you know, and I'm just like, it's only because it's me that this is going to work. This is we can't keep it up this way. So it's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree agree more with that. I mean, our, our tech is very simply displaying people's emotion through biometric technology. So through a band like this, it's feeding into the UI. And it's interesting to, to gauge people's first reaction to our tech, where they're seeing it for the first time, they're like, how does this not exist yet? You know, so there's something about the design, which is just so intuitive that people are like, wow, I all of a sudden have this objective relationship with my emotion that I never had. That's been yeah. one of the most fascinating things about user testing because actually we're living in a society where emotion is consistently rejected so to have designed something where someone's like how does this not exist i'm like are you fucking kidding like (laughs) you know how much this is to create in in a society like ours but it's taught me a lot about design that that just echoes exactly what you're saying that we need to build solutions that are so intuitive that people are like oh yeah i know how to adopt this immediately into my day-to-day yeah, and then we need to learn how to get it in front of people, and that's a whole game now too. Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I think about that too. I'm like, how many cool products am I never going to hear about now? Why? Because there's not one place to hear about them. Mm. And I hope that company knows how to get my attention because I don't even know how to find me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully the algorithm will pick it up based on something else you liked on Instagram that day. Maybe. Yeah. If I, you're just, lucky. I just I think that's a limited game. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it, it also, it's also in a way taking us away, like to bring the conversation full circle from um, the the approach of bringing people back to community where it's not, we're not, there's not a dependence on these fast paced, really hyper scalable Silicon Valley solutions, right? To some of the world's greatest problems, but actually we're back in an environment that we can manage um, and that's bringing us back to our true nature. I mean, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Cause I, I see you as someone that's also very kind of business minded and oriented. You clearly have a hunger for, for scale, right? Yeah. And part of the message is the simplicity of what it means to be a tribal human being. Um, how do we find kind of reconciliation as we evolve forward? Cause I definitely don't want to see us go a step back from evolution and, and technological progress. As the solution, I see that's definitely not I see my it as a one-two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I see it yeah. as a one-two thing. I actually think that they go well together as a married pair. They're like mm-hmm. two different elements which we need to introduce into our lives, and it's almost like we need to have a space for both. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I very much feel like we're going to be moving back into these more conscious tribal uh, community based ways of living. Um, that's probably going to take on a very, very modern spin. Um, I see some interesting things coming up with the conversion right now of a lot of these business spaces, which are no longer occupied, things like super malls, um, mm-hmm. those being converted into communal living spaces. And then that will naturally bring back this need for us to figure out ways to interact that are much more beneficial. But a lot of these needs, which are not being met in the society today, will be met through the, that type of way of living. That doesn't mean that to do that, we have to completely disconnect from the world at large. It's just that the world at large needs to go in a container you know Mm -hmm. this is when i'm plugging into it and this is when i'm pulling myself out of it and plugging into this Mm, yeah i like that and and if you just sort of take us in in how you see this playing out 10 20 50 years into the future um how has society kind of integrated this um and and what does business and and economy look like has that been localized and, and become more community centric Oh God, do you want me to tell you? This is the bad news. Okay. The bad news is that since 2012, we have been in this absolute choice point. What's hard for me to answer in terms of this being somebody who looks at life path potentials all the time, can't not, is that there's like this, it's like watching the stock ticker with how many different potentials keep showing up. And these potentials right now are so polarized it is out of control so when you're looking at the future of humanity you're looking (laughs) at things like sustainability or starvation totalitarian control or sovereignty war or peace it's like humanity right now is is fucking bipolar i mean i'm going oh god at any moment which win are we going to choose because we've i'm literally looking at both of these potentials so with that in mind it definitely matters what we're going to be doing right now um but let's take a look at, at the positive potential of humanity, right? So living in these more conscious tribe-based societies, these are going to serve as the template to then interact with the world. So a lot of these, let's say that you have like a, within the tribe, you figure out a, a different way of creating commerce in a way that's benefiting all people, not just like a few people you know, with all of the power in their hands financially and everybody else within that picture is essentially on a rat wheel. It doesn't look like that. So a lot of these, you know, financial ways of doing things are then going to be bleeding out into the world at large. And a lot of these ideas that are working are going to be something which other people, you know, pick up. And so you start to see the same thing you see right now with like the hundredth monkey thing, where when something is really beneficial for one group of people, it becomes adopted by another group of people, but that is going to be a much more conscious process. And of course the, the genesis of a lot of these brilliant ideas on a global scale are coming out of, of these smaller models, because when you've got like a concentrated group, you've got almost a microcosm that can then reflect out into the macrocosm. Um, I see a lot of, a lot of, you know, what we do with punishment reward, no longer being a system coming out of those tribal based, or I should say communal living based uh, situations as well. We're arriving at a time, it's the one that I'm the most interested in. We're arriving at a time right now where we're understanding that the punishment and reward based system of control regarding the way that people behave as being something that doesn't work at all. And so I'm watching a global trend in the direction of things like rehabilitation. And that's a very powerful thing because it's much more in the direction of us acting towards each other from this state of understanding and love. I can't, I can't help something to come back into alignment by punishing it into alignment. I can't do that. I need to understand the motivations. I need to get deeper than the surface level and I need to offer some kind of an- antidote. And, and so th- the way that we operate with each other is going to be just so much more beautiful when that is not the way that we're approaching um, people who are causing some kind of a detrimental pattern to occur within a society. Um, obviously the, the medical system is going to completely change when we're operating from that mentality also, because there's no effing way for us to capitalize on illness anymore. You know, dare to dream. I'm daring to dream. (laughs) Same. (laughs) We can't capitalize on, on illness. And so what that means is that the entire approach to health is a preventative one, but Mm. I don't even want to use the word preventative because it suggests that we're resisting something. It's more like we have a much deeper understanding of of the essential ingredients to well-being for a physical human, and we're helping each other to realize and actualize those beneficial 
experiences, a big part of which, tying back into the tribal dynamic, is the human need for other people. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just sitting here with my, in prayer position, just waiting for the time when the hundredth monkey dynamic happens and people across the globe realize that we are intensely social. I'm, I'm blue in the face with this talk I have to keep having, where I have to keep reminding people that they're a social species, right? Because we've gotten this like addiction to independence. Why? Because we have all experienced so much pain interpersonally that we don't want to have any dependence on each other. But guess what? I don't care whether you want that or not. It's the reality, right? And it's scary for people to confront the level of dependence they have, whether it's on other people or other things in the world. I mean, you don't have food, you're gone. That means you're dependent on your apple. So it's like we have to develop this, this comfort with you know, our relationship with dependency and things like that to understand we are relationally dependent and it doesn't matter what age, right? Because well, people love to have that argument. Okay, I get it. As babies, you absolutely need somebody else to be there for your well-being. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There's not some weird line in the sand. For your well-being, you absolutely need social contact. So how about we find a way to make it so that we're interacting in a way where there isn't this deep level of loneliness, which is an epidemic today, you know? So I, I very much see it being in the future that nobody expects somebody else to be alone. No one. That aloneness is really something which a person seeks out not to push anybody else away, but to almost like be in a space of emptiness or stillness so that they can be more aware of what is happening on an internal level. There doesn't have to be a me versus others for that type of experience to occur or happen, right? Hmm. Okay, so all of this is to say that with our finger on the pulse of what human needs are, we can bring that about for each other in a very, very strong way. And so you're going to just see the wellness overall of, of these different you know cultures coming up. And it's going to be, I think, a very beautiful thing because we can share the medicine we all have to share. And it's not like, it's not like every tribe is the same. It's not going to be like that. You know, mm. right now there's a, a real push um, towards almost like a, for humanity to become all the same, you know? And I don't think that's the picture of where humanity is headed. I feel like this is a short lived thing. People are going to understand quite quickly the benefit of, of different cultures and different perspectives and, uh, you know, even potentially different languages. Let's hope that we can keep them alive at the same time as creating a way for us to communicate. Like what I see in the future is that we're going to have one language, which everyone speaks no matter what, but there will be a very big push for other languages to be maintained within, you know, these tribal settings so that, you know, because a whole, a whole language conveys a way of thinking about the world. And that's a very beautiful thing. So what I see in the future is that our, our races and our cultures are going to be something like a medicine that we draw forth from so as to share it with you know, other groups of people. And as a result of doing so, it's like we've got these powerful resources which we're exchanging. And that becomes a, a powerful form of currency, not just let me give you this thing so I can get what I want. You know? Oh, God, I could be here all day long talking about this. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Keep going. <laughs> uh, it's... Uh... They're such important topics, you know. I, I believe that our tech um, is laying the, the foundation of a potential currency where we can actually quantify emotion, the way that others' emotion influences us, impacts us, the way our emotion impacts, influences others. Um, we have the technology to turn that into a currency, and I think it's a, a true currency that could actually strip away um, the, the fear that many people that rise to wealth have around protecting things, protecting assets. Imagine if everything you have is actually marked with your energetic signature um, because that that's how our whole system of currency has been developed like that's kind of how I foresee some of these solutions happening in the future is we're building technology as a bridge to externalize what is internal so that it becomes like irre irre irrefutable you can't you can't deny it anymore we, we, we can kind of move beyond those arguments and childlike behavior of that's mine or that's mine but rather like this is something that I created with my energy, um, with, with my emotional capacity. And if I give it to you, I can, I can trade that um, out of my own sovereignty. I think that that's a much more beautiful picture of what that could look like in the future. You're taking us out on a limb where most people are like, wait, wait, wait. I need, I need like a brand new idea. So. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, well, it's, it's, it's really um, refreshing to hear you kind of speak about what some of these systems might look like in the future. And I do believe that it's um, innovators and entrepreneurs job right now to be asking some of these more kind of radical questions, like how do we completely redefine our health system? How do we completely yeah. redefine our currency system? Yeah. And what are the key kind of questions that need to guide um, that uh, process of design? Like uh, one of the questions I'm constantly asking in my my tech team is what is the story our tech is writing for humanity? And this yep. is not a question that tech companies are asking. Like if everyone was using this tech tomorrow, what's the story that's getting written? And that really matters, you know, like we're yeah. all living inside these egregores, so to speak. So if you're going to go out on a on a limb and, and, and seek to, to create something that's world changing, you better be pretty conscious of of what that thought form is going to look like for for humanity. I mean, I'm sure you contemplate this considerably in in your work, and maybe you know it would be great for you to share some some of those key considerations. Like, if everyone around the world was practicing your practices, what are some of the the ways you envision the world looking like as a result of that? Well. There you've almost brought us full circle and, and yeah. uh, essentially to a place of like what it is that I want to leave as a legacy. Mm. What I'm ultimately doing is changing the mind of humanity. And what I'm deeply aware of is that when you change somebody's mind, everything they do changes. When you change the way that people add meaning to a situation or you change their relationship to their reality, reality for them changes. So, you know, I'm acutely aware that when I do something like talk about how important it is to attune to the emotional system and how to appropriately deal with emotions, maybe there's some person in college right now who is wanting to become a teacher and that will dictate the entire way that they are interacting with their children. So mm -hmm. you change, you know, society's mind. Society is made up of individuals. These individuals are the ones that go continue society or change society. So there's no way for society to stay the same if people are listening to my ideas. There's no effing way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very aware of that. And I, I'm, I very much enjoy that, but it puts me in the position of very much so having to try to play it forward as to what, you know, any misunderstandings might lead to, you know, mm. the kind of stuff that I don't think many of us have a, a great pulse on when we're creating things where we see a positive potential. I mean, the best way to put this is to just have us look back at the man who invented the atomic bomb. I mean, I can tell you that a lot of, of the ideas around what would happen with that was not, oh my gosh, this is going to be the worst thing that ever happens to humanity. Mm -hmm. this is, it's a lot like, oh, it's about peace, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of these people who invented these social media platforms didn't really conceptualize the fact that they would completely capitalize human conversation. Yep. They would literally own the rights to human discourse. That's mm. scary crap right there. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to say that for any of us, it's a perfect science, you know, mm. it's just, it's what you said. We need to be asking these questions. It kind of ties in with our conversation that we were having earlier, you know, talking about the awareness of our own power. We very much have to try to play the tape yeah. forward for the worst possible scenarios for whatever it is that we create. Mm. Because it is completely unprecedented. I mean, the ne the, the next founders of billion dollar companies it, are going to be like teams of one to three people. Like that's, I mean, that that even compared to what we're seeing right now with the world's leading technocrats, like this this is another level again. These these are companies that have been built with you know an, an engine room of, of thousands of people. You know, the the future of that level of inheritance of power is going to be several people with the support of artificial intelligence. I mean, that's crazy you know so w w there's no stopping the degree in which an individual is able to inherit power in our world so i agree with you that the only thing left to do is to get really interested in our own evolution so that we can try to use that wisely and not you know destroy all of humanity in the process i guess <laughs> his, his his hoping um yeah and you know thank you for sharing that because I, I think existential teachings and, and spiritual teachers right now do have such an important place as we're kind of, uh, I think, challenging mm, religious ideology, you know, more than ever. Um, I, mean, I think more countries, I mean, I'm, I'm here in Australia right now. 
I think Australia is actually considered like a non-denominational country, which is pretty crazy because it's it's a part of the the Commonwealth. You know, we were we came from from Britain. That's pretty. That's that's a sign of the times, right? And so, what what's going to replace that landscape? Um, wow. Because because religion, yeah, I know. Just at the end, I'll just throw in religion. We can talk about that. <laughs> but the, the the place that is, you know, was religion in our society, whether you hate it or you love it or you're kind of somewhere in between, it was a very important structure um, of our society. You know, it was the underpinning of of many things, community all the way through to understanding of values, how to conduct oneself. Um, all these things and that as that gets stripped away like what's going to replace that um and what's going to govern you know um artificial intelligence because it's definitely not going to be you know the bible so these are really really important questions and i think the role of people like yourself um extends um to those th those degrees you know I'm, I'm glad you think so it doesn't feel like that <laughs> well i think it needs to you know, and, and I'm curious, like you're, you're kind of in the space, you're living and breathing it all the time. Are these conversations that um, those with, you know, uh, who are spiritually gifted or maybe um, spiritual leaders in some way, are these conversations that are happening um, in a day to day capacity? And if not, like why? And, you know, what, what, can, what can happen there? <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> All right. So the first thing that I should say to this is that it very much feels like people who are considered to be on the spiritual spectrum, especially leaders in the spiritual um, space, are in a place of complete rejection. Mm. It feels like we've been lumped happening. No, no, no. Like if I, it's, it's the opposite. It's like we have been lumped in with re religion. Like right now, the message that those of us that are in my line of work are receiving is you are not wanted anymore. There is no respect for us anymore. It was, it's a very different landscape. I got to tell you, because I've been here enough years now that I, I got to experience what it was like before in this right. huge transition. And it is like getting whiplash beyond measure. Because mm -hmm. it, it used to be that if you had this kind of information or you set yourself up as an authority in this space, you got a lot of respect for that. And you know, people came to you wanting this information and there wasn't this much resistance. It is not like that anymore especially with the younger generations, the attitude that people meet you with is, why the hell should I be listening to you? And this has gotten about a thousand times worse with social media when, you know, Nancy from, let's say, Colorado has a, just took a yoga class and now has decided that she's going to have her own quotes on her Instagram too, right? And I'm, I'm telling you, like with the podcast space, this has gone absolutely crazy because right now the the biggest spiritual influencers are not spiritual teachers they are podcasters they're people mm -hmm. who are basically saying you know i want i'm going to garner all the attention essentially and i'm what i'm going to do is i'm going to have all of these this like sprinkling of different ideas so actually people who are kind of like stars you know in this in the space of spiritual leadership are vanishing i mean vanishing and a lot of people who I know who are in this field, who have been in this field for a long time, are just like, done. Done. Also, you know, we're being, in order to continue to stay relevant, which you, you must do, you know, if you're going to have a following or, you know, any of the things that we would normally need in order to, com to execute this as a career, it's putting you in a position where you're now competing with... <laughs> You're competing for attention, essentially, with all the other people on the planet. And I'm telling you, this is not something that most people who fall to the spiritual side of the spectrum are willing to do. Mm -hmm. Most people in my field do not have an intense entrepreneurial streak. They're not going to be like, I'm going to show up every single day. I'm going to get a whole team, and that whole team is going to continue to post every single day, which you have to do. So most of them are just like, you know, I'm just, it's almost like I'm just going to float out of, <laughs> float out of being relevant. and. I'm telling you right now, like I, I, I have these conversations with my team all the time because it's just crazy. I mean, it's absolutely, completely crazy. And in order to teach in this field, you have to be willing to be crapped on at a level where I mean, <laughs> you know, it's unheard of for somebody in, in my position. Honestly, you have to be willing literally to be crapped on every day. Mm. It's not an echo chamber of positivity. It's an echo chamber of the exact opposite. The loudest people on on you know technology platforms are the ones who want you to die mm. it's very weird yeah 
podcasters and other new spiritualists. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you guys listening, if, if, if that's, if that's your experience, I think that's a, that's a statement to oh, be unpacked. Like, <laughs> so the, you can see this even with algorithms. So right now yeah. there's no way for you to have a, a, a life or a career outside of the internet. And that is making it. So it's very trackable. Mm. So the people who are doing lists about spiritual influence, Watkins is a good example. Mind, body, mm. spirit magazine every year does a list of the most influential spiritual people. Right. And I'm telling you, I, yeah, at the time, this is what has changed in the very yeah. beginning. You know, when I started to make those lists, it was like, you'd see these names and like, you'd recognize every one of them. It was people like Eckhart Tolle. It was people like Marianne Williamson. The whole landscape has changed where suddenly it's people like Gwyneth Paltrow with goop. <laughs> is Gwyneth yeah. Paltrow a spiritual teacher? <laughs> no. And yet one of the most spiritually influential people on earth today. Hmm. And so what's, what's getting convoluted that? Till is it is it the that their orientation towards their subject matter is kind of like I don't know like wellness oriented and then there's this kind of association like how have we become so lost from the fundamentals perhaps of what spirituality even is and maybe you want to bring some definition to that because I think that that's really interesting. Well, if we're going to talk spirituality, it's it's essentially having your foot in the non physical picture of reality. Mm -hmm. But of course, having your foot in the non-picture, non-physical picture of reality brings into powerful reality that the physical life here is the most intensely like, spiritual experience that there is. So there's no way to become, you know, intensely spiritual without becoming a master of life, right? Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay, so knowing that, um, I honestly just think it's about who is able to get the most attention and what is the most interesting. But why, why, why is that convoluted with spirituality? I mean, that, that used to be a celebrity, right? And, and celebrities weren't really unanimous with spirituality. So how has that, how's the trajectory of that changed? The trajectory has changed because the credit used to go to the person upon whom that thought originated and it no longer happens. You know, if oh. a celebrity used to go and say, train with some kind of an Eastern mystic, they would be very open about where they got it from. Now it's right. just. Now they're, now they're taking credit. Oh, yeah. So now it's like, you really need to understand the why, you know, and, and like, they've got five that I mean, it's obviously who doesn't want to see a really sexy woman, you know, in lingerie, but like, now that's the person who's talking to you about <laughs> these, these types of concepts. And this is, you know, it's very, it's difficult. And it definitely challenges the ego for somebody who is, has made their entire life about this practice. Yeah. Because it's no longer a requirement for somebody to be deeply in the work. They can mm. just talk about the work. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, that's spot on. Has it, has it made you question how far you would go to, <laughs> do you have, do you, do you... <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what, what are the limits? What are the, what are the limits to get the mission uh, visible? Yeah, I do. And I, I mean, I, I run into this issue a lot because I, as a sort of joke sometimes i'm like you guys i i've decided on it's our new not, strategy every saturday things. it's gonna be strip tease okay you guys <laughs> I, every time i convey an important concept i'm gonna strip but only when you guys all give me the thumbs up that you get it you know <laughs> of course i've had thoughts like this um <laughs> yeah our only it's about not with the sprinkle <laughs> of spiritual teaching <laughs> i'm what it is is that i i'm not willing to compromise my own integrity and None of that is around <clears throat> sexuality. Yeah. I don't want people to sort of make the mistake that that's where it is. What it is is that I, I don't want to be a dancing monkey for algorithms, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of arguments on my team about this, you know, because it's like mm -hmm. when I hire these experts and it's their job, right? Their job is to get as much viewership as I possibly can on a video. And they know that it would happen if I would just talk about this and stop talking about this. But I know that what humanity needs, I mean needs, is to know about this. Then we get into these huge conflicts where it's like, well, Teal, it's not interesting to people. So <laughs> stop, you know? <laughs> So now my, my team's, I mean, I feel sorry for them because my whole team has to kind of, you know, get to a place where they're like, all right, Teal, listen, we're going to give you concepts that people are actually interested in hearing about. Okay. But then like, occasionally you can do what you want. Just like, try, really try, please. You know? 
<laughs> Maybe you can start a podcast and then get the influencers to come and they can wear the lingerie and then you can ask them questions about the meaning of life. <laughs> yeah, see, so that's the other thing. So, so that's the other thing I've resisted. So everybody says, this is the recipe, right? The recipe for garnering the largest following possible is to be the person interviewing. And then all of those people start to follow you. But I, I've got real resistance to this. Because there are so many people who are in this space that what they're really wanting is to be the one that's in the limelight and to be the one that's talking. And yet they're just essentially doing this to use everybody else's platforms to put themselves in that position. And I've, I've seen a great many in my career, a great many platforms, especially spiritual platforms that are just like massive. And, and then it's like it, at the beginning, it's this beautiful collection of concepts. And then it's, yay, now that's mine. Everybody's on me now. And that is a person who does not, I honestly, most of those people don't belong in the positions that they're in. And I, I, you know, so that's that. I'm intensely aware that I'm not really, I like, I love conversations, but I'm not really interested in, in interviewing other people. What I'm, what I came here for is to be a channel for information. So what I'm wanting is different ways to get that information out, which is why I've not started a podcast. So. Yeah. And I, I completely just, uh, as a, a sort of caveat, completely agree that someone that has a gift or a talent just needs to be doing all they can to stay in that gift and talent. And um, I actually, um, I, I listened to, to your episode with, with our mutual friend, Jason Campbell, and you were talking about the competitiveness, right, of um, being oh. in, in, this, in, in, in the spiritual field. And actually, like, one of the questions I, I had, I'd love you to speak to that, A, and then B, but like as you're elevating consciousness, like is it is it still so relevant in your experience to compete, or is is mastery and excellence and maybe vibration kind of enough to contend with the the nonsense of constant competition, or is that just a really naive way of looking at it? I think what's naive is for people to expect that when anything is a, a field in which natural competition exists, that you, so somebody shouldn't be competition minded. That's insane. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that people don't want to do is look at, let's say, the business of self-help or the business of spirituality and see that everybody in that field is in competition the same way that plumbers are with each other. Like, <laughs> is there ways to maybe set up win-wins with other people? Yes. But there is an intense level of competition that is the reality of stepping into the space. Um, okay, so that's the naivety. But what I feel like is that a lot of people have a resistance to the concept of competition. And there's a very big difference between resistance and competition. You mm. can feel it in the body if you're attuned to it. You know, mm -hmm. when you're in almost like what I would consider a negative form of competition is when you're encountering somebody or something and you're, it's like you've got this feeling in your body of like wanting to go completely against them to shut them down because you're afraid that there's some resource you're going to lose because of it. I definitely have felt that in my, in my being, being in this, this space, but you know, you're talking to somebody who was a competitive athlete. There's no effing way that somebody could convince me that competition in general is negative. I absolutely love competition. Mm. It's a very interesting energy to play with because Competition has the, this capacity to push you to literally the best of the best of your own capacity. And so, you know, I feel like there should be some kind of natural competition. And I don't really think it has to be an against, you know, there mm. is definitely this level of compassion, which I would see as a more enlightened form of, um, did I say compassion? There's this, there's this like natural. Competition. <laughs> oh. I, I'm just the best, you know, it's like, hey, we can all accept it. <laughs> There, there's, a, there's a place that you get to when you're really in alignment with competition where it's like you're almost meeting the people who are really good. Not yeah. You don't want them to go away because you're like, you know, I know that having you in the sphere is going to make it so that I am just like leveling up and leveling up and it just makes you better and better at what you do. And if you're better mm -hmm. and better at what you do, you're delivering a better product <laughs> for the people who are, you know, listening to you. And so obviously me being a naturally competitive person, and wetting my teeth on that feeling, I, I don't want that feeling to go away completely. I just don't think no. it it has to take the form that it's taking right now. Like the market right now is so saturated that we are a threat to each other. Mm -hmm. So in the spiritual field, you don't see a lot of, um, you know, real tight friendships or um, great partnerships or the like. You see like a lot of intense, oh no, at the end of the day, it's basically you or me, you know? Yeah. 
Totally. I mean, th this is the argument in, in business around having enemies, which, which I fundamentally agree with Ex exactly what you're, de you're describing, obviously not on a, on, on a soul level, you want everyone, you wish everyone peace, but to, to have enemies uh, allows you to basically create a polarity of energy between you yeah. and, and, and whatever they're up to, which is a huge catalyst for um, the acceleration of your own excellence. Um, I definitely apply that strategy in, in my business and, and in my life. And, and actually it, it, it makes me feel grateful for, for enemies. So maybe that's the, the, the spiritual kind of reframe that you can, <laughs> you can have an enemy that you can feel genuinely grateful for their existence. <laughs> yeah, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I, I very much like differentiate between having enemies, which I have plenty of, and like... <laughs> Having people who you're competing are against. intensely competitive in the field that I myself reside in. Mm, yeah. I also, I, I do, I have to say too, like, I feel it's very necessary for us when we're in the space with other people who are a competitive element or a competitive force to us, especially when they're ones that do really good work. It's mm. important for us to maintain a level of serious respect for what they do, regardless of whether we believe in what they're saying or not, or completely agree. And yeah. they, I, there are definitely a few colleagues that have been in the space where I, I feel that way. Like it wouldn't matter whether I got into public debate with them or whether I was competing with whatever algorithm they're writing. It's like at the end of the day, if they died, I'd want to be at their funeral and be like, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is such an important point. Thank you for highlighting that, you know, r respect, losing respect for someone just because uh, we, you know, they make us feel inferior in some way, I think is also one of the flaws that we need to heal as a mm -hmm. society that creates all of these crazy power dynamics just to finish this off, I want to go back to your reflection on spiritual teachers actually feeling like they're, they're not wanted right now in oh, the yeah. world. Like that's, that's a seriously sort of confronting statement, right? And like why? Why and how has that happened and over what, in your experience, over what kind of time frame? Um, because obviously there's still an appetite, right? If you're noticing that influencers and celebrities podcast hosts are kind of taking that that seat i wrote in my last book there's a god-shaped hole in, inside of everyone that's going to be filled with something so you better be you know careful what that what that is so there's still an appetite for it so why the rejection there's no appetite for leadership right what's being thrown out as an is this there used to be a sort of drive towards an authority figure and a drive towards a leader and right now especially the millennial generation and the uh, gen z generation has thrown that out the window there's mm -hmm. a, I don't want any of this. I don't want my information to come through a single person. Mm -hmm. So that's why, that's one reason why I feel like podcasters especially are, are going in terms of spiritual influence. Mm -hmm. This really, I mean, the landscape really started to change around, I would say, 2014 or so. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting because a lot of these platforms that featured many teachers were the ones who were gaining much more power than individual teachers. And all of a sudden it made it so that if you, if you wanted to be relevant, you had to do deals with them. Mm -hmm. um, what was interesting is it was actually the publishing, the publishing house, Hay House that started this trend, I think in the early nineties, they were like, you know what, we're going to be the ones that essentially mm -hmm. pull all of these mega stars to us. And then like, we're the ones who put them on the stage and we're the ones who take their following, like all of them. And then we're the ones who, so you know, they played a big role in, in the landscape change. But then, you know, when, when things started to become digitalized and everything, they became irrelevant and it started to be taken over by things like, you know, companies that were doing e-courses and things like that. I mean, I was even around before that was a thing. The first time that I was hearing about e-courses, I was like, what? What is this? You mean you're not doing that many book contracts? Who doesn't read? You know? <laughs> But it, yes, it was just, what was interesting, so as it, it sort of evolved slowly, but you started to see in the very beginning of my career, for example, I was, I very much experienced a celebration. Mm. It was like the information is wanted. I am wanted. So there's all this, this like desire for me to show up in different places. There was opportunities all over the place and that dried up, you know, and a lot of that is because people have a very big issue with me in general, more so than other spiritual teachers. I'm like probably one of the most controversial people that there is, but <laughs> you know, as I started to talk to my colleagues, they were experiencing the same thing. It was mm -hmm. like all of a sudden there was a target on our heads. And as this progressed into 2020, you started to see this rash of 
attack, actually, organized by mainstream media companies, um, whether it be news outlets or whether it be even worse documentaries or, you know, series that were done specifically to attack spiritual individuals. And so you see all of, I mean, everybody started to get labeled as like cults and, you know, you see documentaries like the OSHA documentary coming out and things like that. And it was all of a sudden, like, you find yourself in this place where everybody's looking at you like you're the biggest threat that there is. And all of a mm-hmm. sudden, your, everything changed with your demographic because it's like even the people who followed you obsessively, they start to get influenced by this external, you know, thinking about, oh, wait a minute, you shouldn't be following somebody else. Wait a minute, this is really dangerous. Wait a minute, have you seen how many negative markers there are? And so all of a sudden, even your people don't receive you the same way. Mm-hmm. So a lot of things shifted from your specialty needing to be about conveying concepts and information to your specialty being about working with resistance. Mm-hmm. And I, like, I'm telling you, I do not know, I don't know a single spiritual teacher that has not been gone after in the most recent years since 2014 in such an aggressive way that a lot of them have had careers that have been completely destroyed. Hmm. And a great many of them, they're not going to be the type of people who step into the field anyway and just say, I'm going to stay here. They're kind of people who are like, you know what, I'm going to pull back then. Hmm. I have watched my colleagues drop like flies. Hmm. Not something I ever thought would happen. You know, I was, there have been a, more than a few teachers where I was like watching them come into the space and like, oh, this is going to be the person who in the future is like, it's going to be them and me. And it's like, where'd they go? You know? Mm. And you contact them and they have these horrible stories. I mean, horrible stories about intentional takedowns and stuff that you just never saw before in this line of work. So, mm. so from a, from a spiritual perspective, what's the, um, the, the process, the, the antidote um, for uh, survival, I guess, to, to rise beyond these kinds of attacks in the landscape so that these kinds of messages can still, you know, be heard. I think, I mean, this is going to be an interesting answer that I give you because when I've been striving to understand this, what stood out to me the most is that there's been such intense wounding around authority figures. Yeah, And we have to understand that in order to understand why people are reacting to us the way that they're reacting. And we have to answer to that terror around authority. So mm-hmm. you know, part one is answer to that feeling of authority. Step two is you got to figure out what message it is that you're wanting to give people, even if they bite you. So there's been a real mentality shift in me um, away from needing there to be, you know, this mass level of approval or a mass level of offering of opportunity to, all right. What is the original reason that I came down into this line of work? It's because I needed to answer to suffering. Well, this is an element of suffering, right? It's this relationship that we've got with people who are doling out advice from, you know, as an opinion in this way, right? Um, I, I very much like to see people when they're in this kind of a state by thinking about animals. When animals are caught in cages or, you know, especially steel traps or something like that, when you're going to help them, it's not like they've got an attitude of, oh my God, thank you. You know, they're biting the crap out of you. So I, I, I mean, I feel like part of it is getting to the point that is if you really like what you do, right? Fundamentally, you have to really love this. You have to love conveying information. You have to love working with people in this way. But assuming that that's an element of it, it's like, to what degree do I care for this creature, even though it's biting me? So Mm -hmm. I had to very much more develop that type of an an attitude towards people. um, I did want to mention too, that when, when it comes to the landscape change, you know, a big element of this is that with the, let's say rising of social media, you no longer had to qualify yourself in any way. And I'm not talking about traditional qualifications because the spiritual leader can't, can't present those. You know, it's not like, oh, look, no I got a degree. <laughs> I got a degree in being a spiritual leader. But there, w- I mean, obviously, each one of us, when we rise to these positions, before we had to qualify ourselves for those positions, right? Mm-hmm. And when everybody can get a piece of public attention, you no longer had to qualify yourself. So what happened with social media is that people were now drowning in an ocean of opinions, and there's this attitude of everyone's opinion is equal. Yeah. And there, there's a very big difference between everyone's <clears throat> opinion matters and everyone's opinion is equal in a space. And I feel like that's very difficult for people to swallow. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's the foundations of many, um, let's just say, not so brilliant political infrastructure to believe that equality is the the real kind of antidote to to bring about freedom for people. That's a very uh, inaccurate statement. Um, so I, I, that makes a huge amount of sense. And so for someone that's maybe listening to this who wants to embark on a spiritual journey, right? Where where to begin? How to find the teachers? Um, that, you know, that they want to walk with, what to look out for. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if, if they're following Nancy from wherever, 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 who's uh, telling them to keep calm and carry on and, uh, they, the, the, that's the, 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 the closest they have to existential guidance. Um, where, where to begin? Short, short listing the people that they really want to invest in and, and truly learn from. I feel like this would be a different answer based on what each person was looking for, because I feel like each one of us in this field have very different uh, areas of excellence, you know? questions maybe they can ask themselves to to get clear on that and, okay, and if i'm a person dis discern. okay if i'm a person mm -hmm. who's trying to enter the the landscape of you know spiritual practice i'm going to ask myself why why is it that i want to go into the spiritual space now let's say that the answer that i get is i want i want deeper levels of internal peace then what i'm going to start doing is i'm going to start looking at different people's like different let's say professionals opinions on what internal pieces and i'm looking for what makes the most sense to me mm -hmm. when you when you when you run into something and it like deeply resonates with you right that can be for people a very good way to get them into this type of work mm -hmm. and I, I very much when people are in the spirituality 101 phase encourage people to follow what it is that resonates because it's almost like you get this internal yes that's the direction yes that's the person and i would encourage people to dive deep with whoever resonates at that level hmm. where i have to switch this up a little bit is that the you have to walk in with an awareness that when something resonates for us it means that it's close to our conscious mind so yeah. <laughs> We are likely to, when we when we make only something that resonates with us, our barometer for whether somebody is actually on or not, <laughs> it's a very dangerous game that we're playing in the long run, right? Because all of our shadows can fit into that box. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I'm a naturally uh, emotion-resistant person, and I trip across some expert who's like, there is no necessity for human emotion. Human emotion is something which is limited to our temporal form, and it is something which greatly damages what we are capable of as a physical human. That is likely to resonate with me. Mm -hmm. So I would say you can walk with your with that what really does hit as, a, as something that resonates in mind at the same time as being like, wait a minute, what is the reason that this resonates with me? I, I really need to also be looking at, you know, why it is that I've got this hit with this thing and what potential shadows I might have for liking this thing and what bias I have that it already confirms. So, you know, what I would say is that the, the first thing that people should do when they start to walk this path of awareness is they should become immensely curious about their whys. And I mean the whys behind everything that they do. Mm -hmm. I actually did a video on this. It's on my YouTube channel. It's called like find out the why or something. I'm pretty sure if you type Teal Swan and why that was, that's the video that will come up, but it's talking about how, how that's the foundation of everything when it comes to the process of self-awareness, which is, you know, really what the process of spirituality is about mm. is really questioning yourself relative to everything you're doing, everything. Why am mm -hmm. I wanting this? Why am I doing this? And diving as deep as you possibly can. So it's like a personal excavation process. And there are so many, you know, people out there that have, incredible tools for that process of digging internally hmm. so you know i would i would not want people to limit themselves this is something that i would you know like to say and i'm somebody who can say that even when it comes to that woman in colorado there is definitely something that she knows that i can learn from there's some there's something that everybody can teach you um but what you will find is there will be certain individuals which are a real um let's say a deep dive of a lot of tools and a lot of good information, but I wouldn't want people to limit themselves. You know, 
I would want yeah. people to be like, that's a very good resource. And I'm going to continue using that resource at the same time as, you know, open the field to collecting a toolbox of what really works for them in terms of concepts and strategies and processes and, you know, whatever else it is. Yeah, I, I totally, you know, I, I know in my own journey, my greatest guides have been the people that have been able to see further than me at certain times and truly been able to guide, uh, you know, light um, to, to areas that, that I was blind in. And I know for me, that's definitely been a, um, it's been difficult to find. I definitely don't come across those people, you know, regularly. Um, and because I've only ever really had one or two of those people in my life throughout the, the course of my life, um, I've learned that actually that, 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 that there's a reverence necessary. And I guess that's kind of more of an Eastern um, philosophy, right? That when you, when you find the, the guru to, to really have a, a reverence for that teacher student dynamic um, to not be so half in half out, you know, what I want there to be is, is two things I want there in, in people to, to be a deep level of respect for the amount of effort and energy is put into this. Like if you're with somebody who is a leader in a field or a professional in some way where they've dedicated every ounce of their being to something that deserves, it doesn't matter whether it's somebody with me or me with another expert that deserves a wait a minute. I need to be open to what it is that they're going to say. Mm. So I would really wish that people would approach people in my, you know, genuinely in my position with that type of an attitude. At mm. the same time, I, it's very important that people don't just hook, line, and sinker things. It's super important <laughs> that they're able to, you know, canvas their, I don't get it, why type of questions. Because until something is internalized, meaning a person can look at it and be like, oh, that's my truth now, and genuinely my truth, it's just useless crap. It's just them parroting, and that's, very, that's empty, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are again to this dichotomy. I'm like really hoping that people can hold this dichotomy of, of what mm -hmm. we might call like a deep respect and therefore a deep level of openness to things at the same time as it being a space where somebody can bring their butts, you know? Hmm. Yeah. But it's got a different, I'm telling you, it's a different energy. Like, I don't have a problem. I really don't. I don't have a problem when people are like, wait, wait, wait. I, I'm going to, for hours, for hours and days and months, like, but, but I've got to, when there's a, a genuine want to understand, that's not what we're running into in this field. Hmm. What we're running into is I already know you're a problem. So everything you say, I'm going to block, I'm going to block and I'm going to hmm. disqualify, you know? Hmm. Yeah. One thing that I would love people to, to take away from, from this is, you know, if you are, if there are parts of you that say are craving a deeper sense of inner peace, um, a greater capacity to love, uh, reconciliation with your own power in a way that feels natural and congruent and, and, and these, these things that there are actually ways, um, and there are paths that are going to lead you there. Cause I think we have become to almost, you know, kind of pessimistic and, and com complacent, which I think is what you're describing as the experience many spiritual teachers are having, um, where there's just like no, no one can, can, can guide me there. And um, I think that's something that everyone listening to this podcast, especially if you're a leader, can hopefully take away with you. You know, that if, if there are parts of you that are still fragmented, as we were talking about, that are still children in adult bodies and you know there's parts of you that need to be reparented you need to kind of grow up um you, you need to heal um not just for the sake of the quality of your own life and your intimate relationships but but because of the implication of the decisions you're making every day i think that's a that's a really powerful thing to to hear um and you know till i've loved this conversation we've covered a lot of ground from <laughs> global leadership to, to religion, to <laughs> spiritual teaching, to technology, to the future of currency. <laughs> um, oh no. <laughs> but are, are there, are there, is there anything else that, you know, with all of that in mind that, that you would love to sort of share thoughts or maybe questions you want to throw back to, to these guys? I would like the people who are listening to this to really understand that we're no longer at a point where it's a luxury to, have a much deeper level of consciousness about what it is that we are doing and why and the implications. Mm. I don't think it takes a genius or a particularly spiritual person to see that. 
So, you know, it's interesting me as a spiritual teacher, you know, like asking me what I would say. And I, you know, I would say, I I don't even really care right at this moment, whether people consider themselves spiritual or go down the path of spirituality. You don't even need to call it that. We need to go down the path of awareness, no matter what field we're in. Yep. To become uh, both the observer and the, 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 the doer simultaneously. Yeah. I am. I'm hugely, hugely passionate about that. And I think that's such a brilliant, challenge for for us to leave these guys with um till we're going to leave all of your links uh, for these guys to learn more if there's anything in particular that you'd like to guide them to maybe some um up and coming events uh we have a pretty big following in california as well okay. um yeah would would love you to give that a plug yeah, I, I have an upcoming event in miami and then i'm going to be going to vancouver and toronto after that if you go to my website and you go to the events page, you'll see them right there. I am also doing um, in-person events, which are smaller events where I take people for an entire solid week deep into their own shadows. So if you're somebody who is real curious about Sounds like what's fun. going on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's fun yeah. for people who like to get a laser for a week. Yeah. I love them. They're my favorite things to do in the whole universe. But I mean, you really have to have an appetite for like self-awareness to go down that road. Otherwise, it's like an acute torture. Mm. Uh, I totally love those. But honestly, the people, it feels to me when I'm interacting with your consciousness and also the people who who are associated with you, it feels like these are real curious seekers. And so the place that I would direct them to is my YouTube channel because I have four years and I'm talking years upon years. I have been releasing content. I release a new video every single Saturday about whatever subject under the sun, right? What's upcoming is parental alienation. What just came out this week is how sexuality actually impacts the totality of your relationship and therefore is one of the most important elements of compatibility, but most people don't know that. So I have like covered so many topics under the sun that it prevents or sort of presents, not prevents, thank you, presents this opportunity for people to, you know, go down the rabbit hole basically, which is what is the most interesting topic to me and click on it. And then like, what's the next most interesting topic and to click on it. And like, I feel like that opens a whole new world for people in terms of the type of questioning that they have and, and the new understandings as to some of the dynamics that they themselves may be grappling with. Mm. Amazing. What a, what a brilliant starting point for, for, for those who are, who are ready to open Pandora's box and maybe then the, the, after they watch a few of them, the week of <laughs> battling your inner yeah. demons would be, would be Pre- next. Prepare okay. you guys because they actually do. They call this the teal swan rabbit hole. Prepare <laughs> for a marathon. You know. I love it. Till, so grateful for you and your time. You've been very generous um, with all that you've shared and we're very excited to share the episode. So thank you. Okay. It was wonderful to be able to have this conversation with you. Likewise.